Welcome, and in today's session, in this session, we're going to be doing Matthew chapter 8. Now, we got to take this into a little bit of a con its own context now. So, Matthew chapter 8 talks a lot about different miracles that Jesus did, healings and miracles, casting out evil spirits and such. You got to take this in context. The context is, we just finished Matthew chapter 7, where Jesus taught hard and strong against sin, against people who don't go by the law of God. You know, he taught hard and strong against hypocrisy and against sin. Okay. Now, can you picture this in an outdoor setting, in an open air setting? Okay. And I can tell you from doing open air stuff myself before. I mean, I've, I've been there. I've done that. I know what it's, what it's like. When you say anything that even slightly irks somebody, they're gone. They're just gone, okay? So when Yeshua is out there, when Jesus is out there in the open air and he's preaching hard and strong against hypocrisy, against the hypocrites, against sin, against those people who pretend to be holy, against then those people who pretend to be followers of God or believers in him and, and they're, they're actually going to end up in hell. When he preaches like this and he you know, talks about sin, he talks about judgment, he talks about hell. I'm telling you, anybody who's... Who I mean, you you have a choice. It's either you repent when you hear that, or you know you you are holy. I mean, you are, it's either you're a holy person, uh, or you repent, or you just walk away. Okay, uh, you don't you preach this kind of stuff in the open air. The crowds that are left are not going to be people who are unrepentant sinners. Okay. They are going to be people who are either people that are holy, people that are humble, people that obey God, that have no problem with obeying the, the, the commands of God, the commandments, people that have no problem with hearing messages against sin, against, or against uh, hypocrisy, messages of the judgment of God. And so in this context, these are the kind of people that are left, okay? Verse... 1 of Matthew chapter 8. When he came down from the mountain, when Jesus came down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. Okay, again, what multitudes are these? This is not everybody, 100% of just any Joe Blow off the street. These are the people who have no problem with the hard truth, with the hard message of, of judgment against sin, of, of being cast out from heaven if you are, a, you know, claim to be a follower of Jesus and really have sin in your life. You really, you know, are not obeying the law of God. These, these great multitudes are the people who really love what he says, humble enough to receive it, and if they needed to, they would have repented by now. You can't just listen to this kind of preaching. I mean, you look at the last verse of Matthew chapter 7 where it says the people were astonished at his teaching and, and the power which he, he, he came, uh, came forth with power uh, and the teaching was just with authority. Um, so these great multitudes are those who were left, you know, after open air preaching, uh, those who have no problem with the message of repentance, holiness, righteousness, obeying the commands of God. Verse 2, Behold, a leper came to him and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if you if you want to, you can, make, you can make me clean. If you want to, you can make me clean. So we got a leper here. Um, he, he must have either repented of his sin or he was humble enough, you know, to, to lay everything down for, for Jesus uh, humble enough to hear the, the message against sin, against uh, hypocrisy, against hypocrites. And he's still humble enough to come to that same preacher who's preaching you know, hard against sin, hard uh, message of righteousness and, and judgment, and to come up to approach him. I mean, that tells you something. Here's a leper, a man who is still apparently suffering, suffering from leprosy apparently at that time comes to the Lord and says, if you want to, you can make me clean. 
Now, it says in verse 3, Yeshua stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I want to be made clean. Immediately his leprosy was cleansed. Jesus said to him, See that you tell nobody, but go, show yourself to the priest, and offer the gift that Moses commanded as a testimony to them. Now, again, let's totally understand what this is talking about here. Let's, I want you to wrap your mind about... Uh, 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 I want you to wrap your mind around what's going on here. Here we got a crowd who just heard a hard message. Those of, obviously, those who didn't like, you know, being rebuked, left. Okay? Those of, those who had pride that didn't, that didn't want to let go of their sin, you know, left. Those who didn't like that message of judgment, left. Okay? So we're left with a crowd of of humble people, lowly people, who are hanging on every word of Yeshua. Okay, so a leper came to him from that crowd and said, Lord, if you want to, you can make me clean. Now, Jesus didn't say, hey, you know what? Because, you know, there are some preachers today that are like these faith preachers that say, you have to believe that it's God's will for you to be healed. And you have to claim your healing. You have to you have to quote Isaiah 53, by his stripes I'm healed. You don't see that at all here. Isaiah 53 existed at this time. You don't see Jesus saying, oh, go away and say, by my stripes I, uh, you are healed. Even afterwards in the book of Acts, you don't see that kind of stuff, okay? Jesus was just plainly said, I want to be made clean. So you see, it's not the faith of the one who receives as it is the faith of the one who gives. That is the, the primary question here. Jesus, when, when, when he sent his disciples out and they came back saying, why, did, why couldn't we heal? And he said, you, because of your faith, okay? He didn't blame the ones that they were praying for. Say, oh, they didn't have enough faith to get their healing. He blamed the disciples for not having the faith in their prayers, okay? So Yeshua, it's Yeshua's faith. It's Jesus' faith that healed this man, okay? This man had enough faith to come to, to, to the Lord, yes. Had enough faith to say, if you want to, you can make me clean. But... I mean, he didn't have the same kind of faith as a lot of other people had where they're like, Lord, I know it's your will to make me clean. Or I know that if I touch you, I will be clean. Or I know if you touch, you know, uh, me, I will be clean. Uh, this kind of thing. No, it's like uh, Yeshua said, if, or excuse me, the leper said, if you want to, uh, you can be made clean. Jesus stretched out his hand, touched him, and said, I want to, okay? And then uh, Jesus said, see that you tell nobody, but go show yourself to the priest. Now, I know there are healing evangelists, healing uh, preachers today that are, you know, they're, they're praying, they're, they, they have these, these big meetings and they pray, oh Lord, let this be the meeting where everyone was, you know, is healed, all this kind of stuff. Well, they don't have the same kind of, context. They haven't been in open air. They haven't been preaching hard, the hard message of righteousness and truth, uh, you know, against hypocrisy, against sin, and preaching the judgment of God on these people, uh, or on people who are sinners. Uh, and, and, and these people haven't been given the freedom just to walk away as open air preachers, or open air, you know, in the open air, you have freedom just to walk away. If you don't like the message, you know, easily just sleep, just slip away, right? Uh, these people are normally in these evangelical meetings. They're normally in a big room. They're normally kind of contained where they don't feel as comfortable leaving in that kind of context as they would in an open air context. So you got people that don't believe. Yeah. You got people that are sinners and they don't want to repent. Yeah. So it's not the same context here. You see what I mean? Uh, plus, back in those days, they didn't have people who eat like pigs. They didn't have people that eat non-kosher. Everybody in those days, in that culture, they all ate kosher. They all ate according to the law of God. Their diet was that which was according to the law of God, which helps tremendously in your health. Okay, so after this man was healed, Jesus commanded him to, uh, to go and show himself to the priest and give the gift that Moses commanded. What is that talking about? 
those of you who know, uh, when, when Jesus said gift, he's talking about animal sacrifice, okay? Jesus said, go give, you know, offer the gift, the offering, the animal sacrifice uh, that Moses commanded as a testimony to them, okay? So he said, don't, don't go tell everybody. Just go and, 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 and do what, you know, what's commanded of you, and, and, and that's all, okay? Don't, sh- I don't want to, I don't want everybody to know, okay? But look at the stark contrast between that and the, and the, you know, especially like the TV preachers today, where it's like someone at least even claims to be healed in their ministry or in their meetings. They're like, oh, come up, come up here, testify, give glory to God, you know? And uh, they they mask it in this give glory to God kind of thing. But what they really are saying, a lot of them, not all of them, but a lot of them, are the, what they're really doing is they're saying, uh, I want you to show everybody what God did through my ministry. You know what I mean? So, I mean, that is, again, that's completely against the ways of God here. And that's a completely against the way of Jesus, the way he was. You know, Jesus was like hu- very humble and, and very unassuming, very much he didn't want the attention for that. Okay? Verse 5. When he came into Capernaum, uh, Capernaum, Capernaum, the village of Nahum, that is what it means. Uh, Nahum the prophet, that is, uh, from the Old Testament. A centurion came to him, asking him, saying, Lord, my servant lies in the house paralyzed, grievously tormented. Jesus said, I will come and heal him. The centurion said, Lord, I'm not worthy for you to come under my roof. There is humility. Just say the word and my servant will be healed. There's tremendous humility. For I am, all, I am also a man under authority, having under myself soldiers. Now, I understand that a centurion is a man who is over a hundred soldiers. Okay. He said, I tell this one, go, and he goes. And, and tell another, come, and he comes. And tell my servant, do this, and he does it. So the centurion was basically saying, Lord, I know you're a man of, uh, of authority. Hearing what you said in Matthew chapter 7, <laughs> basically, you know, uh, so to speak, hearing what you just said, in brackets, as recorded in Matthew chapter 7, and knowing the authority by which you said it, I, I, can, I, can, I can recognize authority when I see it. You have authority. And I'm a man of authority. I understand how authority works. Just give me your, the word and my servant will be healed just by your authority. Verse 10. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to them who followed. And Jesus was amazed amazed. He said, most certainly I tell you, I haven't found so great faith, not even in Israel. I tell you that many will come from the east and from the west and will sit down with Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov in the kingdom of heaven. But the children of the kingdom, the children of the kingdom being the Jewish people here, being thrown out into the outer darkness, speaking of hell, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus said to the centurion, go your way. Now, this is, again, this is a, a Gentile centurion. Okay, this is why he's talking like this to him. He said, you have great faith. This is amazing. This is absolutely remarkable because those who are supposed to have faith here, the Jewish people, seems like you beat them by a, by a mile here. Go your way. Let it be done for you as you have believed. And his servant was healed in that hour. When Yeshua came into Peter's house, he saw his wife's mother laying sick with a fever. Okay. So Peter had a wife here. Okay. This is, this is kind of interesting to, to understand. Verse 14, Peter had a wife. Verse 15, he touched her hand and the fever left her. And she got up and served him, okay, or them, uh, as it says here. When the evening came, they brought to him many possessed with demons. He cast out the spirits with a word and healed all who were sick, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken through Yeshiahu, Isaiah the prophet, saying, he took up, he took our infirmities and bore our diseases. That's Isaiah 53, verse 4. 
Now, when Yeshua saw great multitudes around him, he gave the order to depart to the other side. Again, here we see where it says he healed all who were sick. Again, who were the all here? The all here were those who were humble enough and repentant enough to hear the, the powerful words that Jesus spoke that many people, I mean, even today, even in church, most people would not be comfortable hearing. I mean, most people, even to go to the church today, most people that go to church today, if they were to hear the message, the, the real hard message of Matthew 5, Matthew 6, and Matthew 7, preached from the pulpit or preached in open air, if they were in open air and they could get away, they would go, okay? Because they're so used to being tickled, their ears being tickled. They're so used to hearing uh, the sweet syrup flow from the pulpit and not the salt. Okay? The all here, again, were those who were able to stick around, open air. They had all the freedom in the world to leave. And I'm sure those there were, there were those who did leave. Those who didn't want to hear Jesus and those who even started out listening to the whole thing. Even, you know... Everything that's taught in Matthew chapter 5, a lot of it's very hard stuff to hear, hard stuff to obey. Anybody who is a little bit uncomfortable with that would leave. So the all here were those who were comfortable with that message because they're humble enough and repentant enough to repent of their sins and get right with God. Those are the ones that were the, the all. So again, comparing that to today, these evangelical ministers who are ministering uh, having these meetings, these healing meetings, and they say, oh, well, we pray that all will be healed. It's not the same context. First of all, you don't have the kosher context, the dietary context. Second of all, you don't have the open air context. Thirdly, you don't have the preacher preaching hard from the pulpit, hard messages that, uh, that a lot of people wouldn't want to hear. Okay? That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken through the prophet Isaiah, saying he took our infirmities and bore our diseases. Verse 18, now when, the, when Jesus saw great multitudes around him, he gave the order to depart to the other side. Verse 19, a scribe came. Okay, again, um, I know a lot of people just read over this and they don't even really know what a scribe is. You need to understand, a scribe is someone who actually, it's like um, you handwrite the Bible. Okay, except they didn't have Bibles back then. They had scrolls. So they copied the scriptures, you know, the Torah, the prophets, the Ketavim, the Nevi'im, the Torah, that kind of thing. They copied the scriptures from one copy. To, so they actually wrote the scripture, you know, more or less. I mean, they weren't the author, the, the original author, but they were the ones who copied the, the, the words that we read now in the Bible and, and then some, okay? Um, so... A scribe was looked at as someone who should really know their stuff because they basically that's their profession to give their life to copying the scriptures. Uh, and, and they do it by hand. They don't have photocopiers or computers in those days. So they did it all by hand. So a scribe came and said to him, teacher or rabbi in the original language, uh, I will follow you wherever you go. Okay, again, Jesus must have been very convincing here. Very, uh, just quite the air of authority. Very convincing, very holy, very, um, the, you know, just a commanding presence. A, a com and a presence also that was irresistible for those who were very, who were again holy and humble enough to receive it. Verse 20. Jesus said to him, the foxes have holes and the birds of the sky have nests, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. In other words, I, you're not going to come to some big mansion. You're not going to find it. I'm sorry, but I, you're not going to come live in some big mansion when you say you're going to come and be with me. I don't have a house to live in. Okay. That's basically what he was saying. I'm, I'm just traveling from place to place to place, preaching the gospel. Another one of the disciples came to him. Verse 21. Lord. Allow me first to go and bury my father. Sounds like a very noble thing to do. Hey, it says in the scriptures, honor your father and your mother. Let me go bury my father. My father just died, okay? Have mercy upon me. Uh, you know, have mercy upon me. Have grace upon me. You know, feel sorry, feel pity for me because 
my dad just died. Okay? Jesus said to him, follow me and, lay, and leave the dead to bury their own dead. Wow. There's the nice, humble Jesus. This is the nice, um, you know, the ever so loving Jesus, I should say. I mean, he was humble, but not ever so loving in, 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 in the context of what many people today uh, think that he was like. You know, he's not like some kind of hippie that goes around hugging everybody and kissing the trees or something like that. Verse 23, when he got into a boat, his disciples followed him. Behold, a violent storm came upon the sea, so much that the boat was covered with the waves, and he was as but he was asleep. The disciples came to him and woke him up, saying, Save us, Lord, we're dying. This was a bad storm, really bad storm, <laughs> not just a little thunderstorm. This was a bad storm. The disciples, that would have been how many of them? Assumably, probably all 12 of them thought they were dying. But Jesus said to them, why are you fearful? You of little faith. Then he got up and rebuked the wind and the sea, and there was a great calm. The men marveled. They were amazed. They were astonished. And they said, what kind of man is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Verse 28, when he came to the other side, into the country of the Gergesenes, or the NU scriptures, the what a lot of people believe to be the oldest manuscripts, call it the Gadarenes. So when he came to the other side, into, into the country of the Gergesenes, or the Gadarenes, two people possessed with demons met him there, coming out of the tombs exceedingly fierce, so that no one could pass that way. No one, no one could go by that way. Behold, they cried out saying, What do we have to do with you, Yeshua, Son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? You see, a lot of people don't even believe that Jesus was the Son of God. Even the devils, even the demons, even the evil spirits knew that. Okay? And they knew that Yeshua was powerful enough and he was, uh, you know, he was the Lord God, uh, uh, you know, of all. And they, that he could and would torment them when the time came. So they knew also that the time, the time being the, you know, judgment day or the, you know, a lot of people might call it the end of the world has not come yet. So they knew all these things. Now there was a, a herd of many pigs feeding far away from far away from them. We all know that Jesus didn't like pigs very well, although he created them. Why? Because Jesus is the living Torah. And the Torah says that pigs are unclean. I mean, they're fair game in the eyes of the devil. The demons begged them, saying, If you cast us out, permit us to go away into the herd of pigs. I mean, without missing a beat, Jesus said, Go. Go. You know, a lot of these animal, right, animal rights activists today wouldn't be very happy about that. You killed thousands of animals, innocent animals. Okay, so Jesus, why did he say go? Because he knew, again, that this was fair game. This was legal ground for the evil spirits. He was unclean animals. They're unclean. They're legal ground, so to speak, for the evil spirits. So the evil spirits came out and they went into the herd of pigs and behold, the whole herd of pigs rushed down the side of the cliff, uh, rushed down the cliff into the sea and died in the water. So they all committed suicide. You know, suicide is of the devil. Suicide, evil spirits cause people to commit suicide just as evil spirits cause these pigs to commit suicide. Verse 33, those who fed them fled and went away into the city and told everything, including what happened to those who were possessed with demons. Behold, all the city came out to meet Jesus. When they saw him, they begged him that they would depart from their borders. Isn't that interesting? Because a lot of people today would, well, Jesus, come on, come on in, come to our house, come on in, come on, Jesus. This, in this circumstance, they're like, go away from us. You're too powerful. You something. You just you caused a lot of damage here. You caused how many, perhaps millions of dollars of damage in, in, in loss of livestock. 
Now, one final word about this, and this was on my my heart to say about the herd of pigs rushing down the cliff into the sea, committing suicide, driven by evil spirits. Again, to say this about uh, suicide. You look at you look at it. Every credible witness of anybody who attempted suicide and was resuscitated back from being clinically dead will testify. Okay, many, if not all of them, uh, every every testimony every testimony that I have ever heard, and I've heard so many, um, too many uh, that have come back. They all testify of going to a place that we all would have no other word to describe it other than hell. A place of torment, outer darkness, fire. So, yeah. um, Those who commit suicide cannot hope for anything more than that. And a lot of times the reason why people commit suicide is because I blame the church. I blame the pastors, the cowards who are too afraid when, when they're doing a funeral of someone who has committed suicide. They're too afraid to really tell the truth. They always, they're in, they're in heaven now. They're in a better place. Well, what happens when you... When you say that, people in the in the crowd will think, oh, yeah, commit suicide and go to a better place. That lie has cost countless people to kill themselves. I mean, they it caused countless people to kill themselves and caused countless people to go to hell. Yeah, we should be sensitive. Yeah, we should be compassionate. I have no problem with that about people who and families and friends of those who have committed suicide, no problem with that whatsoever. Yes, be compassionate, be sensitive, but no, don't lie to them. Don't say they're in a better place. Yeah. I mean, yes, give them all the the help they need to get over the horror of it, but but don't lie to them because they can go commit suicide themselves. And those, those pastors and preachers that do stand over, you know, coffins or whatever, and they say, you know, Johnny here, yeah, we know he took his own life, but, you know, he's in the arms of Jesus now. Those cowards are going to have to face the judge. They're going to have to face Judgment Day. And when they do, uh, it's not going to be good for them. It's not going to be good for them. For the time will come, as we just mentioned earlier uh, in this in this uh, in this teaching, the time will come. Then the time of judgment will come, just as these evil spirits knew. You know, don't cast us. Are you here to torment us, Jesus? Before the time, you know, the time will come. Well, everybody will have to give an account. Yeah, I know this is a serious note, but uh, it needs to be said. And if you're a pastor, if you're a priest, bishop, whatever, a church leader, please don't lie. <laughs> if you're a coward, get out of the office, okay? Get out of the church, seriously. Um, yeah, so anyway, I'll leave it as that. I said a lot in this video, and uh, it's my prayer that this will be a blessing to you, that this will help you build you strengthen your faith. May God give you illumination into everything that we spoke about today, everything we read today, give you revelation, uh, show you great and mighty things in his kingdom, in his word, by his power. Thanks for watching.